Good morning. Today we're going to talk about the chain rule and the gradient and their applications to differentiability of functions of multiple variables. So first we will bring to mind the chain rule from Calculus 1. We said that when y is a function of x and x is a function of another variable t, then the rate of change or the derivative of f with respect to t is given by that expression, dy dt equals dy dx times dx dt. Now you may have learned the chain rule in your head by the uh, Newtonian um, interpretation of it. Uh, this is the Leibnizian version of the chain rule. So it's the derivative of the outer function with respect to x times the derivative of the inner function with respect to t and that gives us the derivative of the entire function with respect to t. Now we're working with multiple variables and so the chain rule needs to take on a different form. So there's a couple of different versions of the chain rule we're going to look, look at. In this uh, first version we have uh, a function z which is a function of x and y and then x and y are both single uh, variable functions. They are functions of t, um, or um, excuse me, functions of u and v uh, at all these different uh, values of t at which u and v are differentiable. So um, if f is differentiable at a particular point, then the derivative of z or the derivative of f with respect to t is equal to the partial derivative of z with respect to x times the derivative of x with respect to t plus the partial derivative of z with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to t. So we have to do a sum of two different chains. We take the partial derivative of the original outside function and multiply it by the derivative of the inside function and add to that the partial derivative of the outside function with respect to the other variable y times its um, derivative of the inside function. So that's version one where we have an outer function that is a function of two variables and the inner functions are functions of single variables. Um, then version two allows for the case of where both the outer function and both inner functions are functions of two variables. And so then instead of talking about dz dt, we have to look at it as the partial derivative of z with respect to x and the partial derivative of z with respect to t but you'll notice that the um, summations inside both partial derivatives are very similar um, to the version one. And you'll, you'll notice if you like to think about differentials as fractions, even though it's not um, totally correct, that each of these would simplify, right? The, the partial x over partial x would go away and you'd have partial z over partial s. And the partial y over partial y would go away and you have partial z over partial s. So you add in these two different partial z's over partial s equal to the entire um, partial derivative of z with respect to s. And similar um, idea with the partial derivative of z with respect to t. So those versions one and two are for functions of two variables, but we can expand the chain rule to functions of three variables or as many variables as we want. And so this is actually the complete version of the chain rule, which you don't learn in Calculus 1, and we're really not going to use a whole lot of it here in Calc 3 um, outside of just with working with functions of two variables and three variables. But this is the um, expansion of it to functions of as many variables as you might need. Now let's see if we can apply the chain rule to a particular problem. So here are our functions. We have z as a function of both x and y. It's equal to x squared times y cubed. x is a function of both t and s because it's equal to t times the sine of s. And y is also a function of both t and s because it's equal to s times the cosine of t. Our goal is to find the partial derivative of z with respect to s and the partial derivative of z with respect to t. So in order to do this, if we scroll back here a few versions, partial of z with respect to x, partial of z with respect to t, we're going to need a whole lot of other partial derivatives. 
So before you bother even trying to apply the, the chain rule itself, you might as well go ahead and find all the different partial derivatives. And that's how we're going to proceed in this problem. So hopefully you can work these out on your own and verify this is the case. I'll just point out the first one, for instance, the partial of z with respect to x. If we're working up here, that means x is the variable and y cubed is a constant. So you're just saying, what's the derivative of x squared, which would be 2x times the constant y cubed. That's why we have 2x y cubed. And then these are all the other partial, partial derivatives that we could take in this problem, both the partial derivatives of the original outside function with respect to both variables x and y, and then the partial derivatives of both inside functions, x and y, with respect to both variables t and s. So once we have you, or found all these partial derivatives, we can now plug them in to the proper places inside the chain rule. So the goal is to find partial derivative of z with respect to s. This is what it's equal to by definition. And now we'll plug in all those values that we just found. And it looks like this. So 2xy cubed times t cosine s plus 3x squared y squared times cosine t. You can do some um, multiplication and simplification to arrive at that form of the answer um, if you so desire. But once you've done this second line here, you've performed the calculus. You've found the derivatives. You've put them together in the correct application of the chain rule. Um, lines three and four are um, algebraic manipulation to perhaps put it into a more manageable form. Additionally, you could factor out what's in common with both of these. It looks like a t squared, s squared, sine s, um, cosine cubed t. Looks like that's what you could uh, factor out and you'd be left uh, behind with a, a, a summation in parentheses. So that's the partial of z with respect to s. Similarly, we can find the partial of z with respect to t. We've already found all the partial derivatives. We just plug them in, do a little bit of algebra, and we get this expression. Now, it can be argued that using the chain rule with functions of multiple variables is not as easy or as efficient as just going ahead and plugging in what each expression is equal to. I don't have that on a slide, but just so you can think about this, you could, from the start, replace x with t sine s and square that expression, and replace y with s cosine t and cube that expression, and then you have z as a function of s and t, and you can find the partial derivatives with respect to s and t um, just immediately from the beginning without finding partial derivatives with respect to x and y. So that's really your choice. Whatever comes more naturally to you, whatever you think would be easier to do in any particular problem, um, choose what best fits the situation. And so now let's talk about and introduce the gradient. The gradient um, helps us find extreme values on functions of two variables. If you recall from calculus one, extreme values of a function occur at the function's critical points, which are those points where the derivative was either equal to zero or where it is undefined. And the gradient works in a similar fashion for functions of multiple variables to help us find where the derivative is either equal to zero or undefined so that we can therefi thereby find extreme values as well. So this is the definition of the gradient for a function of two variables. The gradient of f is the vector function. So notice it is a vector, it is not a scalar. You'll never say the gradient is two or the gradient is negative three. The gradient is a vector function. And we have some new symbolism here. So this upside down triangle, um, this means the gradient of f of x, y is equal to the partial of f with respect to x times the standard basis vector i plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times the standard basis vector j. Or alternatively, if you like to write your vectors in component form, we have the partial derivative with respect to x as the x component and the partial derivative with respect to y as the y component. If we expand it to functions of three variables, the gradient expands similarly, and we have um, the x component being the partial derivative with respect to x 
the y component being the partial derivative with respect to y, and the z component being the partial derivative with respect to z. But in all cases, the gradient of the vector, uh, the gradient of f is a vector function, and that's very important to um, to remember. So let's look at some characteristics of the gradient. First of all, the domain of the gradient is the set of all points in the domain of f at which the partial derivatives exist. Since the components of the gradient are um, partial derivatives, if the partial derivatives are ever undefined, then the gradient would be undefined at that particular um, xy point or xyz point. The new symbol that we have instituted, the upside down triangle, um, you read that in multiple ways. Uh, one way is the gradient of f. You can also see it written as grad f in some textbooks, or you might say the grad f or del f. It's an upside down delta, so we call it a del, del f. And last uh, characteristic on this slide, if the gradient of f is continuous in a neighborhood of a point p, then the function is differentiable at p. So it's another test for differentiability. If you know the gradient is continuous at a particular point, then the function is differentiable there. Now, how does the gradient help us um, find extreme values? Well, a differentiable function of two variables can have an extreme value only at a point at which the gradient is the zero vector, since those are the points um, where a tangent plane might be horizontal. And why would the tangent plane be horizontal there? Um, because if the gradient is zero, that means the partial derivative with respect to x is zero, as is the partial derivative with respect to y. And if those partial derivatives are both zero, that means that their um, slopes in both the x and the y direction would be zero. And therefore, the tangent plane, if you found the vector that is normal to it, um, would be pointing solely in the positive z direction, and thereby the um, plane would be horizontal. And we collectively can, um, I guess, point out here that for functions of two or more variables, the gradient plays the role that the derivative plays for a function of a single variable. We used the derivative over and over in calculus one to find extreme value um, points, to set it equal to zero, uh, to find where the function, um, where the derivative didn't exist, and so forth. We use the gradient in a similar man manner with functions of multiple variables. So let's do a calculation of the gradient. Here is our function f of xy equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. Find the gradient of f. Since this is a function of two variables, the gradient will be a vector function with two components, each component being a um, partial derivative of the original function f. So the first step would be just to go ahead and find the partial derivatives. So the partial derivative of f with respect to x um, could be found by switching to fractional exponent notation and using the uh, expanded uh, power rule. Since that would be x squared plus y squared to the one half, um, taking the derivative, we'd have one half times x squared plus y squared to the negative one half times the derivative of the inside with respect to x, which would be two x. And then if you combine that and uh, rewrite it, we get uh, the expression you see over there on the right. Similarly, for the partial derivative of f with respect to y, we get um, that expression. Uh, the derivative is very similar. So we can put those together to form the gradient. The gradient of f is the partial derivative of f for the first component of the vector, partial derivative with respect to y um, for the second component um, of the vector. And what you'll notice is since they share the same denominator, you could pull that denominator out of the vector and just make it the vector xy over the square root of x squared plus y squared. And that's where we're going to end this video.